All right. Thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today to learn more about how to build habitat for pollinators in the Southwest. Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank the many people and organizations that make our work possible. We are a member supported nonprofit, and I want to thank all of you who choose to be members and donate. And I also want to thank the Carol Petrie Foundation for supporting our Southwest program and much of our pollinator work. Now, if you aren't familiar with the Xerces Society, we are an international organization dedicated to the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. We have staff in regional offices throughout the United States, and we just recently added the Southwest to that list. I'm based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, but I'm the Southwest Pollinator Conservation Specialist, so here to help anyone in the Southwest. A lot of our work is dedicated to insect pollinators like bees and butterflies, but we also work to conserve other insects like dragonflies and fireflies. And we also work with uh, other invertebrates like freshwater mussels. And we protect invertebrates because they are a really important group of wildlife that makes up 94% of all species on earth. And they play really crucial roles for the function of our planet. And if you're wondering where our name Xerces came from, it is honoring this butterfly on the left here. This is the Xerces blue butterfly. It used to inhabit the sand dune habitats in the San Francisco Bay area, but due to de development and loss of those sand dune habitats, this butterfly went extinct. And in honoring that name, we're dedicating ourselves to the protection of invertebrates and preventing further extinctions. We work to protect invertebrates in a variety of settings with programs dedicated to pollinators and agricultural biodiversity, endangered species, aquatic invertebrates, pesticides, and urban conservation. And we use restoration, research, education, outreach, and advocacy to further our mission. And I just wanted to highlight one of our urban conservation initiatives, which is Bee City USA. They are sponsoring this webinar series on building habitats in towns and cities. And Bee City USA or Bee Campus USA is a certification that communities or college campuses can apply for by committing to a variety of pollinator conservation actions. And I'll talk more about how you can get involved with this initiative later. And the presentation. But first, uh, to understand why we should create habitat for pollinators, let's talk a little bit about why pollinators are so important. While some plants like grasses are pollinated by wind, more than 85% of flowering plants require an animal to move pollen around. And this uh, includes mostly insects. While there are some vertebrates like hummingbirds and bats that move pollen, the bulk of pollination is done by uh, insect pollinators. And since pollinators are essential for so many different plants to reproduce, they help maintain populations of wild plants and creating the seeds and fruits those plants make, which are major food sources for wildlife. The insects pollinators themselves are also food for wildlife and are critical to the diets of many species, including birds, mammals, fish, and even other insects. And uh, pollinator habitat is also compatible with the needs of other wildlife. So if we create habitat for pollinators by growing native plants and protecting areas from development, we're also creating habitat for many other wildlife species. Pollinators are also critical to the production of a lot of the food we eat too. And to just give you, a, um, and they are essential to 35% of global crop production. And to give you a visual of how much pollinators contribute to the food we eat, we partnered with Whole Foods to remove all of the bee pollinated crops from their produce department. So here's what their produce department normally looks like. But without bee pollinated crops, this is what we're left with. So the Whole Foods staff took out 52% of the produce items normally sold at the store. 
This includes things like apples, avocados, eggplant, and squash. And this is just the produce section. Pollinators are also needed for production of things like coffee and chocolate. So we really rely on pollinators for a balanced, nutritious diet and for some of our favorite treats. So considering how important pollinators are to feeding the world, it is quite alarming to hear that many of these animals are in decline. So a variety of native bees, many types of butterflies and moths are currently experiencing declines in both abundance and diversity. And managed honeybees are also experiencing major declines too. And research is continuing to document these losses of pollinators and also the negative impacts uh, the loss of pollination has on plant communities. So just to give you an idea globally, um, over 40% of invertebrate pollinators are facing extinction. And in the US, we are seeing declines in diversity, which means that there are fewer species of pollinators in one place and then in abundance too, which means there are uh, fewer individuals of one species of pollinator. So where we had once common species, they are seen, being seen in far fewer numbers. And this is uh, very apparent with the monarch butterfly. You might know that uh, a lot of their population has declined in the east, about 70% have declined in population and the Western population has severely crashed um, by 99.9%. .9%. And this year we're seeing record low numbers in California wintering sites again. And all of other bees and butterflies are also experiencing major declines. Uh, bumblebees of North America, about 28% of those are considered threatened. So uh, the US is also experiencing this major global decline in pollinators. Now, why are we seeing these declines? Um, some of the key risk factors are listed here in this first one, habitat loss, is definitely one of the biggest major issues for pollinators. And habitat loss just means that there's um, no longer a place for those insect pollinators to complete their life cycles. They don't have the plants they need to collect pollen and nectar from. They don't have nesting sites and overwintering sites. And um, these other factors contribute to habitat loss. So with pesticide use, we can see habitat um, becoming in insufficient for pollinators to survive. And this includes large scale ag use to nursery treatment of plants you may put in your garden to home pesticide use. And the next one being disease and non-native species. This occurs from um, a lot of movement of honeybee colonies which can spread disease to native bee populations. And then finally climate change which is especially threatening in the Southwest because we're already seeing severe effects from increasing temperatures and uh, less water being available due to those increasing temperatures. The good news is, is that we can address these factors by changing our behavior. These uh, risks are due to human behavior and we're responsible for declines of a lot of pollinators, but by changing our behavior and addressing these threats, we can really help reverse uh, these major declines. And um, we're gonna talk a lot about habitat loss uh, and how you can create more habitat, but I'll also address these other factors and how we can uh, consider those when we're building habitat. So you might think reversing large pollinator declines is quite a task and how can an urban area, really developed area, support pollinators. Uh, the good news is, is that insects are able to use really small patches and partial habitats to nest and forage in. And small improvements to habitats can have really dramatic results, at least for generalist species like the Western bumblebee. And if we transform the non-habitat spaces of our urban areas, such as converting a rock lawn into like a native plant garden, we can really support pollinator populations by reversing habitat loss 
and helping reconnect those open spaces that do surround our towns and cities. And here's just a nice visual of how an urban area can supply the needs of many pollinators where resources are distributed across several properties. And this is just kind of highlights the importance of spreading the word through a community and helping others um, know what to do to build habitat for pollinators. So to create habitat for pollinators, let's learn a little bit about pollinators and what they need to survive. So while there are some vertebrates like bats and birds that pollinate flowers here in the Southwest, most movement of pollen between flowers is carried out by insects. And this includes insects that you probably already know. So butterflies, bees, moths, but also things like wasps, uh, beetles and flies are also important pollinators. And all of these insects visit flowers to feed on nectar and pollen. But female bees are special because they visit flowers also to collect pollen to feed their offspring. And this makes them the most efficient and important pollinator because they're collecting lots of pollen. They have it all, they're covered in it. They're usually often very hairy and really great at transporting pollen. Um, their movement from flower to flower means that there's more likely pollen to be transferred to another flower. They also exhibit flower constancy, which means that once they have experience collecting pollen from one plant species, they are more likely to continue visiting that flower. So that means pollen from the same species is going to another individual of that same species, resulting in reproduction. They also forage in areas around a nest, which means that they're really helping create robust seed set in local plant communities. And an, and an important distinction to make is that honeybees are not your typical bee. They are an introduced species. They're not native to the US. And while these bees are experiencing declines, they are not at threat of extinction. And most uh, honeybees are managed by humans and wild populations can actually compete with our native pollinators. So when we're talking about bee conservation, we're really talking about the many different native bees that live very different lives compared to honeybees. So to look at diversity of bees in the US, there are about 3,600 known species here. And if you look at this pie chart, um, this very tiny sliver at the top shows the bees that we probably know best, the honeybee, and then also bumblebees. And, but you can see there's this huge diversity in families. And many of these families have generalist and specialist species. And that means that some species will collect pollen and can use pollen from many different kinds of flowers. But then our specialist species are only collecting flowers and are collecting pollen from flowers of certain species. And they really depend on just those plants to complete their life cycle. And then another thing that you might think of bees uh, is that they're social, but most bees are solitary. Over 70 or about 70% of all species in the US are solitary. So if we look at diversity distribution in the US, you might have seen a headline about this map that was created recently. Researchers um, created this global map of bee diversity, which found deserts support the highest bee diversity. And you can see here in the US where it's the darkest, that's where you have the most species of bees. And why bees diversify so much in arid areas is unknown but it may have something to do with better ground nesting conditions. Ground nest and wetter areas are more likely to become moldy or have water infiltration. They are, there are also higher proportions of specialist bees in deserts or bees that will only pollinate one or a few different plant species. So for example, in the Southwest, creosote has many specialists. So does cacti and sunflowers and so on. Now, many of these bees have some pretty neat adaptations to allow them to do well in arid environments, 
like the ability to remain in diapause, which is kind of like bee hibernation. Um, so in very low rainfall years when their plants that they specialize on are probably not going to do well, they can remain in diapause until wetter conditions arrive. So there's a lot of adaptations going on in the Southwest and surviving our harsh climate. And we have um, about a thousand species in New Mexico, 1300 in Arizona. And there's been some really cool research done in Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument where they have found um, over 660 species of bees just in that little national monument. Um, it's a big monument, but on the grand scale of the Southwest, it's pretty, pretty incredibly diverse. So we usually see bees um, visiting flowers. That's when we typically observe them. But what they're doing at flowers, to, uh, usually the females, are collecting pollen to take back to their nest. So you can lump uh, our native bee nesting habits into three different categories. There are social cavity nesting bees, which are the bumblebees. They're usually nesting in things like rodent burrows or some sort of hole in the ground underneath bunch grasses, et cetera. Um, we also have stem and tunnel nesting bees. So these bees will nest in plant stems or holes and trees. That's about 30% of native bees. And then we have um, the biggest group, our ground nesting bees are 70% of bees. And they're especially prevalent in the Southwest in arid environments. And so it's not just flowers we need to be thinking about when we're creating habitat. It's also allowing for these uh, nesting habitats to uh, be available. Now, I just quickly want to go through the life cycle of what a solitary bee looks like. You have a bee emerge um, at a certain time of year, depends on the species. They, if they're a specialist on one certain plant that maybe blooms in spring or summer or fall. So this bee will emerge and they're usually typically, most species are only active for a few weeks. Um, this female gathers lots of pollen and digs a nest. Uh, in the ground usually, others nest in stems, and uh, lay an egg with a ball of pollen. That egg will eat that pollen, the adult bee will die in their usually short lifetime, and then the uh, larva of the bee will pupate into a pupa and stay in diapause until um, conditions are right, usually until the next year. Now, for the life cycle of a bumblebee, it's a little bit different. Um, they're social bee. So the, in early spring, if you see like a really massive bumblebee flying around, that's a queen that just recently emerged from hibernation and she's looking for a place to nest. Once she finds a place to nest, she'll lay eggs. Those eggs will hatch into female workers who will help grow the colony. Um, later in the year, Males will leave the nest and new queens will hatch and leave the nest and find a mate. The um, rest of the hive will die and that uh, mated queen will find an overwintering site to form a colony the next year. Now, I want to give a lot of glory to bees because they are really important pollinators, but um, I want to talk a little bit about butterflies and moths. Uh, they're in the order Lepidoptera and how they are important to pollination. So many species travel really long distances and that can help um, gene flow between plant populations. So that's, that's one exciting thing about butterflies and moths is that they, they can travel far and help move pollen across a landscape. And they're also specialist pollinators for many species. And many uh, moths play a really a nocturnal role in pollination. Okay, um, for butterfly and moth life cycles to consider what they need for the habitat throughout their life cycle. Adults will lay their eggs on a host plant and host plants can be pretty specific to a certain butterfly or moth species. Usually a caterpillar will only eat uh, plant material from 
a certain plant family or even just a single plant genus or species. So making sure you're incorporating host plants is really important for caterpillars. You might know that monarchs will only lay their eggs on milkweeds. So milkweeds are important for monarch conservation to allow their caterpillars some food sources. Those caterpillars uh, will pupate, um, become chrysalis for butterflies, a cocoon for moths. The adults emerge and mate and visit flowers. So that's where they need uh, pollen and nectar or nectar sources uh, through flowers. And depending on species, they can have multiple generations in one year, um, but they can overwinter in any life stage depending on the species. So things like morning cloak can uh, overwinter as, um, as adults. Some species like monarchs migrate, but it's important to have an overwintering site that's free from disturbance so they can survive until the until the next year. So to create habitat for pollinators, we need to keep in mind three key things. So food in the form of flowers for nectar and pollen and host plants for caterpillars to eat. Shelter, so nesting and overwintering sites that can be plants or rocks or crevices of any natural sort. And then also safety, so protection from pesticides and disease. And, but first I'll start by addressing how to select plants for your pollinator habitat. To give pollinator plant recommendations for the entire Southwest is a pretty impossible feat. As you can see, there's just a large convergence of different ecoregions in the Southwest. We have three major deserts, the Mojave, the Sonoran, and the Chihuahuan plus the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains. There's just a lot going on here in terms of plant diversity. So I'm going to try and give you some good examples of species for certain areas, but not everything I mentioned will be appropriate for your location. So just keep in mind a lot of the families and groups of plants I'm mentioning will probably occur in your area, but if you want to find the right species, you're gonna to have to do a little digging and research to figure that out. So three things you need to keep in mind for um, your pollinator habitat and plants are including continuous bloom from late winter to late fall. So you're supporting many different species that are active at different times of year. You want to have several different plant families that can help support different um, specialist species. And you wanna select plants that are native and drought tolerant, especially for the Southwest. And now, while most insects live very short lives and different species of insects live those short lives of different, at different times of year and others are active all year long. So making sure you have blooms from very early spring into very late fall is really important to supporting those long active species to those species that are active at different times of year and short bouts. So having something in bloom consistently is critical for um, abundance, supporting abundance and diversity. So just an example here um, for early spring scorpion weed in a lot of areas is something you'll see um, as one of your first blooms. A little later, you might see penstemons. This is Rocky Mountain penstemon. It's great for our higher elevation areas, um, attracts a lot of different bees. Globe mallows are usually peak blooming a little later in the summer, but they can bloom throughout the year in a lot of places. Um, and then one of our latest blooming asters are ground cells. And they're a um, really great thing to include for a late flowering resource. Now for plant diversity of families, you wanna make sure you're including several different ones to support our specialist pollinators and including host plants for butterflies and moths. Um, the families featured on this slide are really great for most of the Southwest. You can grow milkweed for monarch caterpillars, and they're also a really great nectar source um, just to, uh, for other pollinators. 
the evening primrose family can support a lot of our sphinx moths and other butterflies and some bees. Uh, there's cacti are actually really important because there are several species that um, specialize on cactus pollen. So those bees are emerging around the times that cacti are blooming and live during that period that cacti bloom. And then also I have the rose family here. So native wild roses are really important um, for pollen resources and they can be really great nesting and nesting structure and nesting material for things like leaf cutter bees. And I'm going to highlight a few more plant families starting with some early blooming shrubs and then some annuals, things that don't usually get as much attention as perennial wildflowers. So the first one is uh, Berberis or Mahonia, uh, the barberries. We have, um, they have very early spring blooms, which is really important for our early emerging pollinators. And they attract many native bees and they also create really nice structure for nesting. And um, one th really great thing about shrubs is that they can provide a a huge amount of blooms in, in a small space compared to wildflowers taking up the same amount of space because they have that vertical structure of habitat, many more blooms can be on there. And the species I have highlighted here, Fremonti, Fremont's Mahonia, um, you can see in little higher elevations like Flagstaff or Santa Fe, and then our Red Mahonia or Berberis humaticarpa is you can see that at low, slightly lower elevations like Prescott or Sedona. Another group I wanted to mention as early, early blooming sh shrubs are, are Ceanothus. So there's a desert Ceanothus and a Findler Ceanothus. The Findlers is at higher elevation. Um, they're also really great big shrubs to include. Um, for our really low deserts, our bean trees are really important for a lot of uh, specialist bees. We have, they're blooming early in the spring, and this includes things like Palo Verde and honey mesquite. Mesquite actually supports um, a lot of specialist bees in the Southwest, so they're, they're a very important family. A couple more uh, includes the Eric A.C., the Heath family, so Manzanita. Let's look up which Manzanita is most native to your location. They provide very, very early blooms, even into the winter, I've seen, I've seen them blooming. Um, and then also sumacs are really, really great. There's Microphylla, and tri Trilobata, see which ones um, best occurs in your area, but they're also a really great early blooming shrub. Um, moving on to annuals or biennials, uh, I wanted to mention Brassicaceae, the mustard family. So I have here spectacle pod and western wallflower. They um, are really great, usually long bloomers, can bloom really early in the year and be important early sources of pollen and nectar. And they're also an important host plant family for butterflies. So that's a good family to consider. Another really cool family that I think is my favorite <laughs> in the Southwest is Cleomaceae, the bee plant family. So we have Rocky Mountain bee plant here. Another one that's more widespread is red whisker clammy weed. Now, why wouldn't you wanna plant something with a name like that? I don't know. But um, bees attract many native bees and butterflies and they can bloom from summer to early fall. Now, I just also wanna mention asters. They're just such a prolific family and can support so many different um, bees across the year. There are some early blooming asters, but most are blooming uh, early in the summer to the late fall. Um, this includes annuals to perennials, and they're just very attractive to many different pollinators. And I just have a smattering here of different species that you can find from low to higher elevation. Um, and I'll just mention chocolate flower is another good one. Green thread and cota are important. Just 
think about native asters where you are. Um, I also need to mention grasses, even though they aren't uh, flowers and creating, or they are a flowering species, but most bees and butterflies don't collect their pollen. Um, they are really important habitat structure plants. So they are host plants for butterflies. Many, many species of butterflies um, lay their eggs and their caterpillars only eat things like blue grama. Budalua is a very, very important genus for butterflies. Um, and they can provide nest sites for bumblebees and provide overwintering sites for insects. And I just featured giant sacaton here because you can just see that it's a really gorgeous, big ornamental native, but it can create, just think of all the insects that can survive the winter inside of that big bunch grass. And I really wanna highlight the importance of selecting native plants. Um, we recommend them for a few reasons. Our native pollinators, have co-evolved with these native plants. So they really are adapted to um, using these plants for collecting pollen and nectar. Native plants are also very adapted to our local conditions and they can have fewer pest problems because they're adapted to living with pests in our local area. So native plants are a really critical part. And I just wanted to highlight a uh, desert willow it's really great for a lot of our low desert areas. And, you know, it's, it's pretty much a, an ornamental plant. It's got big showy blooms. It's really drought resilient. It's just one of my, one of my favorites. And one thing to consider about um, selecting local native plants is when you go to your nursery, don't feel um, like you shouldn't be asking where, where can I, uh, or where have you sourced these plants? Are they locally adapted? And um, see if you can find things that aren't grown in, in an entirely different ecoregion and make sure you're getting uh, species that are able to survive your local conditions. Now, if you have a hard time finding native plants, some introduced species are, are okay. Um, and it's really just important to know that you should be looking to have a foundation of native species, but having a few introduced is um, not, not necessarily a bad thing. The biggest thing you want to avoid is, are any introduced species that could escape your yard and grow in, in other areas or become invasive. And some other things to consider when you're selecting plants is um, avoiding really um, cultivated species like things that have double flowered varieties. Those usually don't have any access to pollen or nectar. Um, some cultivated natives may not be as attractive as their wild types. So just consider trying to stay stick with things that are um, more natural and true to their, uh, their native wild type species. But things like herbs, um, dill, lavender, basil are also are very attractive to pollinators. So our food gardens can be really, really important resources for pollinators. And one thing you can do to figure out what you should plant in your garden is just be really observant, take a walk around and see what you see native pollinators visiting in your, in your neighborhood. Just look up those plants, make sure they're not invasive. Um, another thing to really consider is that when you're buying plants from a nursery or big box store, these could be treated with pesticides. So just be sure to talk to um, who you're buying your plants from. Make sure that these plants you're buying are not treated especially if they've been treated with neonicotinoids or other systemic pesticides, which means those pesticides live throughout the plant and um, usually stay with them longer. Just try to avoid um, buying, buying things that have been treated. Okay, so here's a lot of plant, <laughs> uh, plants to consider here, but um, there are a few different lists out there that you can consider. 
uh, the Xerxes Society has um, one list for the Southwest. It's for the Albuquerque Santa Fe region. Um, that's just pollinator plants. And I'll be working on more plant lists for the Southwest. We also have a list on monarch connector plants that may be of interest to you. And then we've worked with NRCS and NRCS has done lots of research on um, pollinator plants in, in different areas of the Southwest. And also consider um, using local resources such as your extension office and master gardener groups. There's a state native plant society for each state you could reach out to look for gardening clubs, master naturalist or Audubon groups. These are all really great resources to um, go to. And you can also feel free to email me if you have questions. I'll have my email on the last slide. Now, um, when you are considering different species, I just wanted to um, offer this website. It's a really great resource for seeing where plants have been collected. And you can kind of determine, um, is this species appropriate for where I live? It's uh, SignNet, it's swbiodiversity.org. You can type in a species and then see where botanists have collected it in, in different places. So that's just one tool to see what could be native in your area. And the one thing that unites the Southwest, um, which isn't plants, um, is the scarcity of water and our soils that are prone to erosion. So conserving water and preventing erosion should really be at the forefront of your plans for making a pollinator garden. So just consider making sure you're not creating a soil erosion disturbance when you are building habitat and increasing um, the infiltration of water into your soil. So using mulch is a really critical um, tool in making sure that your plants stay hydrated and that you don't have a lot of runoff. You want to have a little bit of bare ground, so you don't want to completely mulch everything so bees can access the ground to nest, but um, making sure that we're, you're not losing water or soil is something you should really consider. And to incorporate diversity of plants into your yard, you can consider the diversity of like microclimates around your yard. So the south side of your house is going to be very different from the north side of your house usually. And you can plan your plants around those really hot, dry areas and maybe those shady, cool, wet areas. Just and consider where you might have runoff of, of rainwater. Try to plant um, plants around those areas so that you can be capturing that water into the soil and creating more plant growth. Also a really important thing to consider is if you can plant your species in clumps. So research has shown that um, bees will be more attracted to uh, plants in clumps of at least three feet or one meter in radius. So one species in that big clump. Um, so I mentioned bees exhibit floral constancy earlier. That means they like to visit the same kinds of flowers over and over again. Um, so if you plant them near each other, these can uh, forage from that one species in one single trip and aren't flying all, all around your yard um, to get a lot of pollen from one species. And while rock lawns have become the norm in the Southwest, and they are better than grass lawns in most cases, they really offer no habitat and they can really contribute to water loss through evaporation. And they help uh, make the heat island effect proliferate, which is just absorbing that heat, keeping that heat in urban areas in the, in the desert. And uh, just consider, uh, you know, it's, I know it's a lot <laughs> to, to take away a big lawn like this, but in, in increments, if you can start slowly building gardens into these um, rock lawns, it's uh, a good way to increase your habitat and water infiltration. Now, if you're worried about this really natural look of lots of different native plants and um, 
uh, a different look than what your neighbors might, might be used to, consider putting up some signs. Um, so you can spread the good news of pollinator habitat and engage and educate others about how pollin what a pollinator habitat looks like, and that's what you're doing with your yard. Um, so another important thing to consider in your yard for um, habitat is nesting and overwintering sites. You um, can create like a do not disturb spaces of brush and rock piles or logs. Um, one thing you can do is remove annual plant material, but leave perennial plant material for insects to nest in. And if you can, leave stems over the winter and trim them back in spring. And that gives access to bees that may nest in those stems. Um, another important thing to consider is not using pesticides in your yard, um, especially those neonics and systemic pesticides, and just a lot of learning to accept a little bit of plant damage. So the pollinators we want to protect, like butterflies, their caterpillars are eating our plants. So just consider that um, you know, you're creating habitat for pollinators to eat if they need to. Um, one important thing about pollinator habitat is that they uh, creating that also um, creates habitat for natural enemies of pests, so things that will eat the pest of your yard. And then also, if you do have pest problems, consider using IPM practices, so integrated pest management, where you address the issues causing these pests to proliferate first before spraying. So where are we able to create habitat in an urban area? I've been talking a lot about your yard, um, your backyards, front yards, gardens, and that's, that's great. We'd love to see that. But if you don't have a yard, if you live in an apartment, or um, if you do have a porch or balcony, you can always put planters of native plants out. That is still going to be a useful resource for many native pollinators. But at a broader scale, we can think about many different areas like community gardens, parks, schools, libraries, roadsides, medians, bike trails, landscaping properties, commercial landscaping properties, golf courses, urban farms, just the amount of spaces in urban areas that could support pollinators is, is enormous. And looking into how you can help those people those others that manage those areas create more habitat is one great way to consider habitat in urban areas. So when you're thinking about getting your uh, community involved with pollinator habitat, there's um, lots of opportunities for engagement. And this can be large or small. Just consider this at, at different scales from a small neighborhood project to large metropolitan resolutions. This, this is um, work that you can do to get others involved and interested. And you can do lots of different fun things like community science and events and collaborating with many other organizations in your city or town. And I also just wanna mention that creating some identity around um, building pollinator habitat is, is, can really benefit a community. And taking action can give your community a sense of identity to be proud of. So investing in the future by choosing sustainable landscaping options and showing you value the land that you inhabit, to, inhabit <laughs> excuse me, and show commitment and that you're showing commitment to stewardship. Um, so just to mention again that in our urban areas, we're really looking to help um, increase uh, water infiltration and decrease our big erosion problems that we often have in the Southwest. So things like rain gardens are really, really great um, tools to use for uh, infiltrating water and preventing major erosion. And that can help with our stormwater management, lots of good things there. And then another reason to build habitat in urban areas um, is creating trees, 
which can really help with uh, temperature regulation. It increases property values and improves aesthetics. They also provide shade, which is really nice in our hot, arid environments, and can really improve uh, parking situations in, in parking lots, for example. And then um, on the community engagement side, this can really um, benefit your community by connecting folks back to nature by building pollinator habitat. You can also pr promote food security through urban farm and community garden awareness. You can celebrate commitments to conservation with events and outreach and exploring certifications for your community to pursue. So again, I just wanted to mention that B City and B Campus certification are uh, options you can consider for um, building a community around pollinator habitat. And uh, this, this involves building a committee of different people that are um, interested in conservation like grassroots leaders, city officials, and local experts. And um, just to look at where B cities and B campuses exist across the US, um, you can see there's a lot on the, on the Eastern US and the Southwest. I mean, we're, we're a little more sparse out here in terms of population, but we could definitely get a few um, more cities and campuses in the Southwest. So if you're interested, um, please contact me or others at Xerces to look more into B Campus or B City certification. You can also join existing larger or larger scale efforts in community science. And this is a really great way to engage students and volunteers and a source for uh, environmental education. Um, here's just a few community science projects I wanted to mention. There's the Southwest Monarch Study that's very hands-on. It's tagging monarchs in the Southwest. Really important work um, to see where, how we can better conserve them. Then we have the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. That's all about taking photos of monarchs or milkweed species, sending those to a database. Similar, the Bumblebee Mapper is taking pictures of different bumblebee species and uploading those. Um, and then the Great Sunflower Project is another uh, great one that does pollinator counts and plant attractiveness to pollinators. So uh, check those out. And then one, I just kind of wanted to end on um, the fact that building community or building habitat for pollinators in a community can really help you build connections with many different members that you may not have in the past. So. I uh, just want to end with this Margaret Mead quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Now, if you would like more information, you can visit our website, check out Bring Back the Pollinators, our Pollinator Conservation Resource Center, and Pesticides in Your Gardens. We also have many different books that you might be interested in um, on feeding the bees, butterflies, how to attract native pollinators. We have fact sheets and brochures, guidelines and reports on many different topics. Um, just go to our publication uh, database and find lots of different topics there. Um, you can find previous webinars on our YouTube channel. This webinar is, is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in a couple of days. And stay connected with us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so you can have a little bit more insects in your social media feed. And I just want to say thank you for joining us. And here's my email. If you have any questions, feel free to just shoot me an email when you have a chance. So thank you so much for joining us and excited to take some questions. Perfect. Thank you, Caitlin. So the first question is actually about fireflies. Um, this woman is actually a transplant from the Midwest and she just said she has a lot of fond memories of fireflies and that you mentioned firefly conservation in the Southwest. Um, where are these found? Yeah, so our fly fireflies in the Southwest are definitely not as 
prevalent as they are out east. I do. I'm I'm from Oklahoma, and they were. I'm missing them every summer. But we do have um, a limited amount of fireflies and, and glow worms in the southwest. Actually, um, they're they're not typically found in urban areas. They're more um, in really more rural, natural areas around. So. Um, I've talked with our, our firefly expert at Xerces, Candace Fallon, about maybe looking into um, some conservation efforts for them. But yeah, they're, you're not going to see them, unfortunately, in most places. Um, but they do exist here. They're just pretty hard to find and uh, far and few between. All right, the next question is about a bee hotel. Um, it's actually the same person has a bee hotel that they never, it never seemed to empty out last year. And they're asking when the best time is to clean them out, um, but they don't want to disturb them, but it needs to be cleaned. Mm -hmm. um, so, gosh, I'm, I'm not super familiar with bee hotels from uh, what I've, what I've gathered in the Southwest. Most of our bees are nesting in the ground. So I, um, have not seen much uh, bee hotel activity, but it's great that you have some. Um, I think we have some resources on when to clean those out. I, I don't know that uh, time period right off the top of my head. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, there's a lot of good online resources. There is a publication on our website, I believe, about mason bee houses and when to clean them out. Um, but yeah, cleaning them out is super important because they can spread disease, especially over years. So if you just search online, there's, yeah, there's a lot of really good resources. Yeah. Okay, so lots of other um, good questions here, just going through them. This one is specifically about trumpet vine and how that might affect pollinators and honey edibility. I don't know if you, know anything about trumpet vine? Yeah, it, it's, it definitely is, is around um, and it attracts a lot of bees, a lot of honeybees. It's important for uh, hummingbirds and some butterflies. So it's, it's a definitely a good um, pollinator plant, uh, but I do not know much about honey production from it, um, but it, it does attract a lot of pollinators, that's for sure. Thank you. So someone is asking about when it'll be available on YouTube. I'm gonna to try to get it up by the end of today, but definitely by the end of tomorrow. Um, Steve is wondering, you said to remove dead annuals over the winter, but leave perennial plant parts. Why remove one, but leave the other? That's a very good uh, question. I, I, I didn't, have, didn't quite have time to address it, but um, so I'm glad you asked. So annual plant matter can um, really harvest or harbor some uh, plant pest species. So our, um, our suggestion is to uh, keep your perennial plant material um, standing and around over winter that usually doesn't uh, harbor as many pest species. So yeah, if you wanna control for pests, um, try and remove some of your an annual vegetation. If you're not worried about pests, you can leave it. Um, but yeah, that's just one reason to uh, leave the perennials and um, get rid of the annual vegetation. Thank you. Seems like we have a few questions just about HOAs in general and neighbors and um, how to talk with folks and especially about not reducing pesticide use, using the right plants. And um, it looks like Robin has spoken with them several times, but they just don't care and they don't listen. Do you have any suggestions on how to deal with HOAs? Oh, that is, that's a really good question. Um, I've, <laughs> I think we've all had some kind of rough experiences uh, working with HOAs. My uh, best advice would just to be get as many neighbors that you can to, um, you know, maybe sign a petition or just support your interest 
in uh, changing their management. So I think there are, there's power in numbers, and if you can find a lot of other neighbors um, to be interested in, uh, you know, changing HOA management, then I think I think that's your best bet. And you can you can point them to these resources, but I think um, yeah, having that. There's power in numbers and the people that uh, are interested um, having having that group effort might might be a good uh, try. A great suggestion. So we do have a pesticide question just to know we do have a few pesticide specific webinars on our YouTube channel. Um, but this is sort of a general question of how long do systemic pesticides persist in plants? Have there been any studies done? And sometimes nursery staff are seasonal and they're uninformed and may not know how plants have been sourced. How would you deal with that? Yeah, so um, for systemic pesticides, there it, it varies because there's so many different um, chemical uh, formulas out there. So it really depends on which one you're talking about on how long they persist in a plant. Um, yeah, you can you should definitely reach out to uh, our pesticide program team. Um, they can give you uh, really really great information on that. Like check out their pesticide webinars that we have. Um, as for nurseries, yes, there are a lot of seasonal staff that probably don't um, know or. Uh, have the ability to know where their plants have been sourced from. But um, yeah, I hate to say it, but be that person that asked for, can I see the manager? <laughs> um, but yeah, just making sure that, um, you know, you can uh, take the time to have a conversation with those people that are in charge um, and maybe look into some smaller, more native plant nurseries they might be a little more likely to um, talk with you and be interested in sourcing plants that are a little more local. Thank you. Emily May also just wanted to mention she's another member um, on our staff in the pesticide team and there will be a nursery pest management guidance coming, guidance coming out in the next month. And that will answer a lot of questions about systemic incesticides and nursery practices. There's also going to be a publication coming out next year, early in the year, and another webinar about how to find safe plants for bees. And that webinar, I think, will be in February, so you can stay tuned for that, too. Yeah. Thanks, Emily May. Hopping back to other questions here. There's a lot of good comments, people helping each other out. We did get one question about where you can purchase a habitat sign. I've just included that link in the chat box. We do have a Xerces habitat sign and it's actually gonna be, we're coming out with a new one, um, I think by the end of this month or next year. So you might wanna hold off on that. But a lot of people have created their own habitat signs to educate their neighbors. We've seen a lot of really creative signs come out um, from our members and our supporters, which have been really, really fun to see. So a question about pollinator plants. Um, are there good pollinator plants with good edible fruit or berries? Yes, certainly. So um, let's see what comes up off the top of my head. Um, golden currant, that's kind of a, a higher elevation um, species, but those, those are delicious berries for sure. And then a lot of our fruit trees um, are you know, even though they're not native, they do provide really, really great pollen uh, resources usually early in the year. So um, yeah, uh, our introduced fruit trees aren't, you know, a really bad invasive species in most cases. Um, and there are several uh, native plants that are also edible too. Um, and that what's after, uh, just fruit trees or was it all edible plants? Sorry, Rachel. Yeah, it looked like all edible plants, mostly berries or fruits or berries or other fruits. Oh, okay, yeah. 
yeah, I, I would definitely um, look into finding a wild edible plant guide and, um, you know, taking note of what plant families those are from and if those are important families for many different pollinator species. All right, another question here. So besides selecting seed mixes, plants and grasses that are beneficial to pollinator habitat, what are other options to help encourage pollinators such as mason bee houses, other um, overwintering habitat, nesting habitat? Yeah, so um, for overwintering and nesting habitat, making sure you have a little bit of bare ground for those ground nesting native bees. Um, for stem nesting habitat, I can actually kind of uh, show this one extra slide I have here. Um, so for stem nesting habitat, you can uh, trim back your uh, large stocky plants that have these nice hollow or pithy stems in the spring, and that allows for access for those different bees to start um, using those stems for nesting. Um, and yeah, just making sure you leave those uh, flower stalks over winter. Um, and then also uh, with overwintering sites, just making sure you have an area that won't be disturbed through the winter, having like a pile of rocks, pile of brush, um, different logs, uh, just that kind of structure. And also incorporating grasses and shrubs into your landscaping is really, really important um, when overwintering habitat. All right, we have time for just a few more questions. Um, this is interesting. I haven't gotten this question before. So this person is seeing bee feeders or feeding bees with sugar nectar. Is this harming the habitat or does it seem to sustain the bee population and this person is from Tucson? Huh, interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen bees feeding from hummingbird feeders uh, and they can, you know, provide sort of a, a nectar source. I'm not sure, um, you know, what the perfect formulation is for that. If it can be like too sugary for bees or something, I, that's something I really don't know. But, um, you know, that's, you know, just one source of food for them is nectar. So for bees to create a, a nest and provide for their eggs, they need to collect pollen too, usually. So making sure you have um, sources of pollen, uh, lots of flowering plants that are producing lots of pollen, that's, that's also very important, um, not just having sugar water around, basically. Um, that's, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, though. That's something I'd like to look into more. Yeah, I haven't heard of those before. That's very interesting. So I love this question. What efforts are being made in state legislatures or local government? I'm most interested in New Mexico where I live in Santa Fe to discourage or ban the use and sale of neonics. What can I do to support such efforts? I feel like I just don't know enough to lobby effectively. Great. Um, yeah, so this is a really um, relevant question. So right now Santa Fe is in the process of becoming a B City USA certified uh, community. So if you want, I can um, get you involved with that local effort, but at a more statewide effort, um, there are some groups, the Defenders of Wildlife, um, Xerces, and uh, the Albuquerque Bee City, they are looking into doing some legislation um, to uh, potentially limit some neonicotinoid use. So um, I highly recommend reaching out to me and I can get you in touch with those folks. Um, so yeah, mostly working at uh, a level of, um, with the, the city, with the B City USA in Santa Fe specifically, and then maybe at that state level if you wanna get involved with um, other efforts that are currently happening. Happy to send those contacts to you. 
Thank you, Caitlin. Would you mind going to your really your last slide with your email address? That way they can they can contact you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Already. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so this is another question going back sort of to the fruit tree question. Um, what are your thoughts on non-native apple, pear, peach, apricot trees, less than 10% cover with your native trees, shrubs, forbs, cacti, desert succulents, and native bees? Or for native bees, I think. Is yeah, that, that sounds, yeah. If, if, if it's less than 10% and you have all of those different native plants, then I think it's absolutely fine. Um, you know, as long as you're not... Uh, spraying those trees regularly with any kind of uh, insecticides. Um, yeah, those those fruit trees can, you know, provide a lot of uh, pollen uh, resources, especially early in the year when a lot of uh, bees are looking for pollen and nectar. All right, another question specifically about habitat. This person, this is kind of exciting. They have a dead tree that they would like to convert to habitat. Do you have any recommendations specifically of what they could do? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's still standing or if it's down. If it's standing and has some integrity to it, it could you know, continue to be um, some uh, woodpecker habitat, um, but if it's if it needs to come down, that's that's great too. Um, if it's laying on the ground and has some nice interface with the soil, then that can really create like a nice layer of good overwintering habitat. Um, try to keep the bark on it for as long as you can. That can also um, be helpful. And I know there's um, some practices of drilling holes um, into wood to create uh, cavity nesting habitats for bees. Um, yeah, I would just like maybe look into uh, any information on our Xerces website about creating uh, cavity nesting habitat that might be able to point, point you in the right direction. Great. So Janice is wondering if you can talk about the value of roadside management and wild area management to support habitat. Of course, yeah, those are obviously very, very important um, to sustaining our wild native populations of bees and butterflies and moths and so on. Um, so our, our natural areas management, usually um, in the Southwest, so what they're trying to do is a lot of times restore forest systems and grassland systems to kind of a, a previous um, like before uh, Smokey the Bear and lots of fire suppression, they're trying to do some thinning. They're trying to um, recreate uh, more historic vegetation types and reduce invasive species. So all of that is going to be good for pollinators. Um, and then on roadsides, there are programs in, in most states to uh, plant native plants beneficial plants on the sides of roads. Um, and also at a national level, um, we have so several people at Xerces working to um, create a national roadside database for pollinator plants. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm out of water. <laughs> All right, just going through and seeing if we have um, any more questions that we can answer in the next few minutes. One woman is asking if it's easier to sow winter sow or better success by starting indoors and transplanting, thus avoiding, this avoids bringing in pesticides or diseases. Yeah, so um, seeding in the Southwest can really be a risky business because we have, um, you know, very unreliable precipitation usually. So it is really uh, considered a better, better approach, more successful approach to try and grow out things into transplants instead of seeding. Um, that is to say it's not, you know, completely futile to try and seed, but you do want to take steps to like make sure those seeds are in a little microclimate that is better for seed um, establishment. 
but yes, if you have the ability to uh, create transplants and grow out um, before putting seeds in the ground, then I highly recommend it. Okay, great. This one is a very specific question. Are choke cherries a good resource for pollinators? Choke cherries, I'm pretty sure they are, if there's the genus I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, is it, I'm not so sure, maybe I'm thinking of service berries, the Amalanker, but um, yes, usually cher cherries do produce pretty um, important blooms in, in spring for a lot of pollinators, so they, they're probably good, if, especially if it's a native to the area. Okay, another specific question about a milkweed. This person lives in Santa Fe and Lutfolia is what they have planted, that species of milkweed. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um, Latifolium, yeah. Yeah, how do they- Just broadleaf. Okay, how do they <laughs> to grow more? How and when to start from seed and to transplant to the yard? Yeah, so um, if, they, if they already have it growing, they could, uh, collect the seeds from, from what they have on their property and try and grow those out and create transplants if they want. Um, they could try seeding them just as, uh, um, but you may not have as great a success. But basically from, from what I've uh, gathered from talking with um, some native plant growers, that they, they really don't need to be that big. You don't need a really giant robust plant for to put it in the ground and have it established well. Um, so maybe just a, a few inches tall is all you need um, to get it really, and, and make sure you harden it off, um, keep it outside for a while, kind of baby it until it, it's ready to go in the ground. And yes, um, Pam uh, mentioned that most Asclepias need to be cold stratified. So yes, a lot of our native species need some cold stratification. So uh, if you're trying to grow them out, make sure they're in the fridge or in the freezer for a while. Um, okay, perfect, thank you. And then so mm -hmm. asking where they can find um, monarch nectar plants or a list of them. I know that we have them on our website. I think you mentioned them. Yeah, so there's definitely a list for the Southwest of monarch, Southwest monarch nectar plants. So yes, if you go to our website and look at our plant list page, just look for um, monarch connector plants in the southwest region, and there's there's a lot of great plants there. I'm just going to put the link in the chat box for the resource center. Perfect. Just click on your region. It'll actually pull up with seed lists and plant lists. All right, so we have time for just one more question. I'm going to pick... Um, Joel's question, how far can bees travel when their habitat has been destroyed? Or what is the furthest recorded bee travel? This is a very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I definitely do not know the stat for what is the farthest a bee has ever traveled. And, and that will also depend a lot on the species. So a lot of our really tiny bee species um, only travel in a pretty short range. So um, yeah, it really depends on the species. Some of them only forage in around a, um, like a football field size area. Others can travel um, a bit further depending on their size. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's really depends on the species and if habitat is destroyed, there, there are a lot of other factors that determine if they can make it to another habitat. If, if their um, connectivity is is in good shape to get them to another habitat. So 
yeah, that's a hard, hard last question to answer. Yeah, I thought I'd end on a on a hard note. I'm sorry about that. No worries. Thank you, thank you so much, Caitlin. And if your question did not get answered, or if you have um, further questions, feel free to shoot her an email. But thank you all so much for your time today. And Caitlin, thank you for taking time to answer questions and for putting this presentation together. And thank you, um, Sally, for providing closed captions. Yeah, thank you, Sally and Rachel. Appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day, everyone.